when the space program started was in the 60s during the civil rights movement. And so I could watch that black and white television where I could see human beings accomplishing one of the greatest feats in the world, but I could change that channel and I could see our people being disgraced, dogs sicked on them, mortar cannons spraying on them to decide that despite what I saw that, that I was going to be an astronaut was a big leap of faith. What do you think were some challenges that you faced when you decided that you wanted to be an astronaut? How was that journey for you? Well, I think the main challenge was the color of my skin. You know, looking at the space program and seeing nobody that looked like me, right? And in fact, there were no women in the early program. There were no minorities that were involved in the program. Things have changed quite a bit, thank God. Yeah, actually hearing you say that is very encouraging. You know, I feel very fortunate. Of course, there are still boundaries and there's still barriers and there's still lack of diversity in a lot of areas. But as a woman and as an African-American woman, even though I, I don't often see a lot of people like me, it, it does seem more tangible and more possible. You were actually the first African-American to perform a spacewalk, correct? I was. What does that feel like? To, to I can't imagine being the first anything, yeah. <laughs> let alone the first African-American to perform a spacewalk. What was that like for you? Yeah, so, you know, as an astronaut, one of the things that you aspire to do, of course, is just to get to space, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had done that a couple of times, uh, but the ultimate is actually to go out and uh, put this space suit on, which weighs about 350 pounds, and uh, open the hatch and walk out for the very first time. And so I get to the door and I look down and what do I see is this earth down below me, right? Moving at 17,000 miles per hour. I paused a little bit and of course my EVA guy said, why are you doing that? And I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing. But what I was getting over was the sensation that the earth was going to pull me down. And, and the other is just the movement, just the sheer movement across the ground was incredible. At 17,000 miles an hour, we go around the world every 90 minutes. Right. And we get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. Pretty cool. It's amazing. Like, even as you're explaining it, it just seems like such a unique perspective yep. that no, you know, very few people ever get. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the first step is just getting there. Right now, I'm in a point where I just want to get to NASA, um, foot in the door. I actually just graduated with my master's degree last week in space architecture from the University of Houston. So what I worked on was a strategy for development on Mars. So there seems to be a gap in that kind of strategic architectural gap between short-term and long-term development. And so what I was working on was kind of trying to build that connection between short-term, first feet on the ground, and then that long-term settlement and development and mm -hmm. permanent Earth independence, if you will. And so if I do work at NASA, I would really like to work in any capacity to just help get people to space mm -hmm. really set our foundations as a civilization in space so in there i think i hear that you would like the opportunity to go you know every time i hear an astronaut talk about space i mm. get a little more scared <laughs> about oh. it but excited <laughs> it, it, yeah. you know an excited good scared i can't even fathom that right now at this moment but if ever i have the opportunity yeah. to work in space, be in space at all. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. As, as you were sharing with me, you know, sort of that gap, I always like to describe to people. Uh, when we went to the moon in, in 69, mm -hmm. it was really easy. You know, we were relatively easy, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I should say, right? So we, we get there, we, we put the rover down, we step on the, the surface, we plant a flag, we do surveys. You know, the first missions were just a few hours, maybe a couple of days and, and things like that. We left our footprints, we left our buggies and we came home. It was an easy trip. And the major difference is that instead of going to the moon, planting a flag, leaving a few footprints and, you know, futzing around a little bit, <laughs> we'll be staying there, we'll be living there. Right. And that gap you're talking about, is the technology that we've got to fill in order to make sure that we're able to survive during that period of time. And to me, that's exciting because you're the right age. <laughs> that's you're, right you age. Chance. you're the to right age these, that, <laughs> that can problems. go. Yeah, I think there's actually a very large growing interest in space and kind of Mars, but 
we got to work to get there. You know, the, the same kind of rallying that mm-hmm. you all had to do to go to the moon. It's the same kind of rallying we're going to need to go to Mars. When we're exploring space, particularly going to Mars, we ought to be doing that as a human race. And if we have that mindset, in fact, NASA says that we're going to Mars in 2020. That's within right. your <laughs> lifetime. That's going to drive us to really think about a race in a different way, a more global maybe even a more universal look at how we treat each other.